Well, good morning, Branch Church. And good morning to our Branch Church family online, if you would. On this side, turn around and say hello. I know that some people are sick and unable to make it, so we want to make sure that they know, we know that they're there. So I struggled this week to find an opening for the sermon. There are a lot of examples of people giving up something for somebody else, but scarcely could I find something where someone took the blame for somebody else. But I found one. So growing up, one of my favorite TV shows was Family Matters, starring Steve Urkel. Anybody seen it? So you might remember this show with the obnoxious, nerdy neighbor next door who was in love with the girl next door, Laura. He called her things like, Laura, my pet. Not sure if she really appreciated that. Actually, she didn't. But he drove the dad crazy. And in one of the episodes, Carl's son, he's the dad, his son drives the car right through the living room. Bust up the window, the door. I, I don't even know how he did it. How did he drive a car through a living room? I don't know, but he did it. And he gets out of the car and he's in a panic. Dad's gonna be furious. He's with a girl. She's not feeling like she should stay. So she gets out of there. Dad comes in hopping mad. And as you see father and son now about to have this really chaotic, angry moment, Steve steps up and he says, I did it. I drove the car through the living room. And in that moment, Steve, even though he did not do it, even though he did not deserve it, he willingly stepped in to take the blame and the responsibility, a big one, for Carl's son who had done that. Have you ever given up something for someone else? I would venture to say that most of you probably have. Maybe you gave up the front seat when you were little to one of your siblings. Maybe you gave the last bite of a dessert to someone else in the house. Maybe you gave the last dollar in your pocket to someone else because you felt that they really needed it more than you. But have you ever taken the blame for somebody else? Growing up, if you had a sibling, how many times did you step in and say, mom, dad, I did it, knowing full well that your sibling is the one who did it? No way, we usually operate in reverse. (laughs) Knowing you did it, they did it, and you want to point at them. Let's make it a little more real. How many of you would step in and take the blame or go through the process of those indicted for the January 6th scuffle? How many of you would step in and take the place of the Minnesota cop who was charged with the death of George Floyd? I wouldn't do it. But I know someone who would. And I know someone who did. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, who came and took the sin the blame and the responsibility for his people. We're in a series called Becoming Christ, and we're looking at the ways in which the Son of God had to become certain things so we could have the Messiah that we needed to be back in a relationship with God again. We've talked about how the Son of God became man, how he became poor. We talked about how he became a slave. Today, we are gonna talk about this. In order to be our Christ, the Son of God became sin. If you have your Bible, turn with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. This is our main text this morning, and we will expound this throughout the sermon and come back to and fro from it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Paul writes to the Corinthians, the Christians in Corinth, and he says this, For our sake he, he made him to be sin." who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's a short verse. Let's read it again. For our sake, he, this is God the Father, he made him, this is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, before we talk about how he became sin and exactly what that means, we have to take a step back. What was the son of God before this? What was he before he became sin? Scripture is unanimous and very clear and emphatic. He was holy. Turn with me to Psalm 99 verse five. And let's look at what the scripture says about the holiness of God. Psalm 99 verse five. The psalmist writes, he says, exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool, holy is he. 
God is declared here to be holy in his entire being. What is God in all of who he is? He is holy. And because he is holy, there is a response required from this. What does holiness lead us to actually do? It says it right here, to exalt God and to worship at his footstool, to fall before, in a sense, his feet and to honor him in this holiness. Go with me a few Psalms over to Psalm 103, verse 1. Psalm 103, verse 1. David, the author of this psalm, he says this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. God, not just in his being, his very name is holy, which also further describes his character and his attributes and who he is. Go with me one book to the right, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. He says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Do you want wisdom and how this world actually works? Who God really is? It starts with a healthy, reverent, respectful fear born out of faith for God. I once saw in a classroom when I worked in an after school program, and it says something along the lines of knowledge begins with wonder. And you could argue in a sense right? You wonder, you're curious, and you go find knowledge. That's true. But really, at the end of the day, where does it really start? In the fear born out of faith of God. Listen to what he says here. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. When you understand that God is holy, you are granted insight into who God is and to how this world actually works. And in addition to that, so importantly, you understand yourself better. You will not understand yourself without understanding the holiness of God. Go with me another few books to the right. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 16. Isaiah 5, 16. Isaiah writes, inspired by the Spirit, he says this, but the Lord of hosts is exalted in justice, and the holy God shows himself holy in righteousness. What does it mean that God is holy here in his actions? It means that he does the right thing. There is a perfection. There is a beauty in his actions of righteousness and justice. When you think of righteous and justice, you are also thinking about the holiness of God. One more, Isaiah 41, 14. He says, fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. So when we put this short survey together, we learn this. God is holy in his very being. He's holy in his name. God is holy in his titles. God is holy in his righteous actions. Everything about God is holy. But now we got to define it. What does it mean to call God holy? When you look at the core of the word holy, the most likely core idea has to do with dividing, a a dividing of things. Another way to say it is a separation. So in other words, God is separated from everything else. You have everything over here and then separate, a divided line away from that is God. Leon Morris in his commentary, he says that God is separate from all things. And in that separateness, there is a moral purity. There's this idea of perfection. Nothing's wrong. So when we look at holiness, there's two core and key ideas here to grab a hold of holiness. The first one is that God is separate and he is distinct. There is God and there's everything else. You draw a line, you put everything on this side, and then you have God over here, distinct, unique, on his own. There is nobody like him. The best illustration I can think of is your spouse. There is your spouse and there's everybody else. There's your wife and there's every other woman. There is your husband and then there's every other guy. There is to be a great holiness for your spouse. There is nobody else. That relationship takes highest priority. When you got married and you become one, you say to that person, you are my highest priority. You are the most important human relationship now in my life. I give myself to you. Isn't marriage awesome? 
it's also a lot to take. It's really heavy, and we want to enter into it with great reverence and fear in the way that God would have us do it. God is transcendent. He's separate. The second key idea with holiness has to do with purity. For something to be pure, it is free from pollution. Another way to say it for God is that God is free from immorality. There is no wrongdoing. Go ahead. Pull up God's resume. Search through his eternal resume. Spend as much time as you want. Get the FBI involved. Get whatever agency does those kind of things. IRS, I don't know. Try to find something, some nick on God's record, some place where he messed up. Will you find it? No, because he is pure. He's perfect. There is nothing wrong that he has ever done. I think of it like a clear glass of pure, fresh water. In that pure, fresh water, there's no dirt, there's no grime. You, you long to drink it, and when you do, you're like, ah, that was so good. Sometimes we think of holiness or righteousness as hoity-toity. Does anybody say that anymore? Hoity-toity, nose in, the, nose in the air, thinking you're all that and better than us. When we think of God's holiness and righteousness, we're not saying that. We're saying he's pure. He's without the grime and the dirt. Who doesn't want a cup of water like that? You see, God's holiness is something that draws us in a refreshing, crisp way that we want to take a drink of. This is good. Why would you want to live a life drinking out of dirty hose water with dirt and grime? And I'll spare you the rest of the analogy, but you get the idea. God is wonderfully refreshing. Now, knowing the survey, knowing the definition now, come with me to Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to look at verse 3, but I'm going to start in verse 1. Isaiah 6, beginning in verse 1. We are going to look at two throne room scenes and see what is declared about God. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. God's glory, his impressiveness is so wonderful, he can't even get like a true shot of God because his robe fills the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, these are angels, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another, and here's what the angel said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the Yahweh of Sabaoth, which is the Lord of the heavenly armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. And look what happens. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. Just awesomeness going on here. And look at what Isaiah says. And I said, woe is me. He didn't say, God, I got something I got to say to you. He said, Woe is me, yikes, because I'm seeing the holiness of God in his temple, yikes, I am, I'm in trouble. Woe has to do with judgment. I'm under judgment, I'm busted, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. God has declared in this passage three times to be holy. What's going on here? We'll take it step by step. To say something twice is to say it emphatic. Mommy, I really, really want to go to the store with you. Dad, I really, really want to go to the dance this weekend. Can I please, please go? You say it twice, it gives a double emphasis. You know they really want it. Now to say something three times in Hebrew is to say it to the highest possible degree. It is what I believe Oswald calls a superlative. It's the highest degree you can say something. We do this when we want to tell someone we love them or miss them. I miss you so much. I miss you so, so, so much. I miss you the size of an elephant. I love you times, times a million, times a billion. Where does it end? You just go for it. You go infinity, and then you got it. I love you times. I miss you times infinity. In a sense, that's what's happening here when something is said three times. J. Alec Moyer in his commentary He talks about how this thrice repeated phrase is something that had to be invented just to try to get finite minds the ability to understand how holy, how distinct, how unique and separate and pure and perfect in that distinction God truly is. Go with me now to Revelation 
chapter four, verse eight. Last book in the Bible, another throne room scene. Revelation chapter four, verse eight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say this. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Not only was God given a superlative for his holiness, repeated three times, it's repeated in full measure now in the New Testament. This must be very important. If you were to describe God in just, you got one word, what word would you use? A lot of people might say, God is love, or God is grace, God is mercy, God is forgiveness. Not a lot of people would say God is holy, but holiness is the word that is used and emphasized to the third degree, the highest possibility, the greatest superlative you could possibly give of it. Is holiness important about God? Absolutely. This is very important that God wants the world to know. I am not like you. I am separate and distinct and amazing eternal glory, never once having committed a sin. Now that you have all of that together, Sean, why are you taking us on this journey? For this reason, to show you what the son of God was. What was the son of God? He was holy. And all of eternity, this was the son of God by his very nature with the father. Now knowing this, Watch this. Go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. A great memory verse for you today. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What happened? God made Jesus to be sin. Let's start with this. Firstly, we know that he knew no sin. What does it mean to say the son did not know sin? That means he had no experience of it whatsoever. If you were to look into the mind of the son of God in his eternal mind, and then when he became a man in that earthly existence, not once did he have a bad thought, a sinful bad thought towards somebody else. Not once did he approach a situation with an attitude of grumbling and being upset in a sinful way. Not once did he perform an action in his home, in his neighborhood, in the synagogue where he committed a sin. Something I think is important is teaching our kids to apologize. When they do something wrong, I, I'm sorry that I did that. I was wrong for hitting you. I was wrong for shouting in such an angry tone at you mom or dad. I was wrong for the way I acted at school, teacher, professor, whatever it is and where they're at. <laughs> Did you know Jesus never once had to apologize? He never once had to go, I'm really sorry, friend. You took my truck, so I just popped you right in the nose. I shouldn't have punched you. He never had to do that. He never had to go back to his mom and dad. Mom, I ate the last cupcake. I'm really sorry about that. I shouldn't have done it. He never once had to apologize to God the Father. He never once had to go to temple and offer a sacrifice for his own sins because he was holy in his eternal existence and in his earthly existence. Now he knew of sin, he saw sin, but he himself never engaged in it. Now, what happens next? The Father made him to be sin. This is it. This is what we've been building. What in the world does this actually mean? I'm going to follow Murray J. Harris. He gives a spectrum. So you got to bear with me here. Here's a spectrum. On this side of the spectrum, there's the idea that Jesus became absolutely sin in an absolute sense. He becomes it. And then on the other side of the spectrum, there's this idea that he was a sin offering. And that was it. J... Um, Murray J. Harris says there is something mysteriously happening in the middle of these two ideas. So I'll break it down a little more. Jesus doesn't become sin in the sense where he sinned. He doesn't become a sinner. He doesn't become absolute sin as if he's absolute evil in that sense sin. But he's more over here than just this sin offering. He, he identifies so closely with sin and its guilt and its consequences that it's like the father can't do, it's like, 
I want to be careful when I say that. It's like the father just sees sin in the sense of what he took. Another way to say it is that he took the curse. Galatians 3.13. He took that curse upon himself. How does God feel towards sin? When we do a little survey in the Old Testament, God is very wrathful towards sin. He hates sin. If you ever want to get a really good picture of Israel, if you ever want to push aside any kind of emotions where you feel bad for her, read Ezekiel 16. It is the clearest picture of how bad Israel is. I'll tell you a few. She's called an adulterer. And that's a nice way of saying what the ESV calls her. But for the sake of kids in the room, I don't even want to say the word. She's an adulterer. And it's one thing to cheat on your spouse with one person. That's terrible. It's another to go to every single neighbor in the neighborhood and keep doing it while they know that you're doing it. That's what Israel did. Egypt, Chaldea, everybody. She runs to them. And then God tells her, you're worse than a prostitute. And you think, what is worse than a prostitute? At least a prostitute gets paid. You do it for free. That's how bad you are. God points out her lust, her lewdness. He says, you're worse than Sodom. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Gone. God says, you make your sister Samaria look righteous. Oh, and by the way, Samaria, she was awful. She was filthy. She's playing in the sewer of sin. Gross. And Israel is so bad, it makes her look wonderful. And one of the most horrific things Israel did was child sacrifice. They sacrificed their children to a false God for their own personal benefit. Jesus took sins like that. He became sin and guilt and a sin offering for things like that. Turn with me to Galatians chapter five, beginning in verse 19. This part of scripture describes works of the flesh. Flesh is something that is not of the Holy Spirit. It is something that God is not pleased with, and he hates these things. As we read this list, I want you to think of this, that Jesus became sin. He took these things fully upon himself, becoming a sin offering, bearing the guilt and the consequences for these things. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality. That one alone is hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine Jesus ever committing that or taking response. Yes, I did that. And it's like, no, no, you did it. No way. You're holy. How could you ever possibly do that? But he did. He took the consequences for things like this. We see impurity, sensuality, idolatry. I can't imagine Jesus denying God the Father and going somewhere else. That's, that's mind-blowing. No, it didn't happen. But he did. He took sins like this upon himself. Sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. This one sticks out to me, drunkenness. I can't imagine Jesus getting drunk or paying the price for someone who was drunk. It's like, no, you can't. You're Jesus, you're holy. Orgies and the things like these, I warn you as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Would you believe the list is bigger than this? I'm going to look at Ephesians 4, and I'm going to skim it really quick. Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 25, Jesus took things such as falsehood, anger, theft. I can't imagine Jesus stealing something or taking the, the, the price for that. Corrupt talk coming out of your mouth, grieving of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, 31, here's quite the list. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice, the desire to inflict injury and to want to hurt somebody. That's not my Lord. That's not his holy heart. Unforgiveness as well. And we could add to this list. There's rape, child trafficking, fatherly abuse. I mean, there are horrific sins that we all know about in this world. And Jesus took those upon himself. It's very exciting to get something new, is it not? New shoes, Maybe a new phone, a new truck, new car, new jewelry, maybe a new wedding ring, whatever it is. How do you feel about that new item? Don't touch it. Don't even breathe on it. Don't scratch it. Don't drop it. Don't break it or else mom or dad, man, woman, whoever it is, is not going to be happy. Jesus, in a sense, is like that brand new thing, spotless, perfect. And God the Father, in a sense, puts him in the truck, takes him to the dump, 
and throws him into the dump. And then while he's in the dump, takes the world's trash and buries all of it on top of him. Do you know how much trash there is in the earth? <laughs> I found a stat on a worldwide scale, we can produce 2.6 trillion pounds of trash per year. That's just per year. Can anyone handle that amount of weight on their body? It would crush you. The average person produces 22 pounds of trash of paper cups and plates. The average person produces 28 pounds of aluminum beer and soda cans. The average person produces 77 pounds of plastic bottles and jars. 90 pounds of tossed out clothes and shoes. 77 pounds of cardboard boxes. And all of that was put on the holy, perfect, spotless, pure son of God. Have you ever looked inside someone's trash? I don't do that. And I probably won't go to your house and do that. But I've looked inside our own trash can, particularly our diaper can. And there's some really <laughs> gross stuff in there. Diaper cans can be so bad, they have to be moved to the other side of the house or outside. I've yet, and I haven't, we haven't bought like a really fancy one, I don't think, but I, I don't think I've met a diaper can that completely works 100% of the time. The smell always wins. The stink always wins. The smell of our sin is gross. And there's nothing that can stop the smell of sin from protruding out into this earth and into the nostrils of a perfect God who goes, wow, that's disgusting, in a sense. And yet God took all of your sin and he dumped it on Jesus Christ, who never did anything wrong, never had to apologize for anything. That's outrageous. That's unfair. It's incomprehensible. It's, it, it feels messed up in a sense. No, you shouldn't have to do that. But we got to ask the question, why? Why did he do that? And here's where we got to finish our verse. So that in him, we might become something. And what is that? that we might become the righteousness of God. Did you notice in the series, there is a son of God becoming so we could become something that we're not. He became all of that so that we could become righteous. I'll put it in a picture. We are like those wearing clothes and robes who have gone to the sewer and played in the sewer for years and we stink. Our clothes stink. You can't wash that out. There's no folexing that. There's no oxycleaning or whatever else you might use. It's not coming out. It's disgusting. Jesus comes down and he lives in your place and he dies in your place. These two concepts are very important. He lived in your place by obeying God perfectly under the law and he earned righteousness. He now wears the righteous robes of a perfect human being under God's law. And then he went to the cross. He was nailed to the cross and he took the sins and the dirt and the grime of us upon himself conquered sin, rose from the dead, and now there's an exchange that happens. He takes your nasty clothes and he gives you his perfect robes of righteousness. And now because of what he has done, what he gives you, you stand before God and how do you look before God? You look spotless. You look good. Where'd you get that? Did you earn that? Nope. Did you pay for it? How much was it? I couldn't afford it. I saw it in the store window and it cost a perfect life, but I didn't have that to offer. But you know what? My Lord Jesus Christ gave it to me because I believed in him, because I believe that he took my sins, because I believe he rose from the dead, because I believe he is the savior of this world and he is the Lord of this world and I've bowed my knee to him. He did all of this so you could become righteous. Today we have learned that the Son of God became sin for us in order that we could become the righteousness of God. And if you are in Christ, in union, which means you believe and you're tied to him, guess what? All of that counts for you and that is what you have been made. You are in a perfect, righteous, what we call justified position before God. Can I get a witness? How do we respond to this? There's two responses. One, we believe for those of you who believe, you keep believing. For those of you who don't believe, you need to be confronted as Isaiah was. Woe is me, my sin is gross. I need help. I need someone to atone for this. God has provided that for you and his son, Jesus Christ. And the Bible says it very clearly. Romans chapter 10, verse nine. If you would confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart 
that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be rescued from your sin. He brings you into his kingdom. You have a new life and you follow him. And this leads to the second response. Be holy because God is holy. He says it in Leviticus 11:45 and 1 Peter 1, 14 and 15. Just as holy, holy, holy was repeated, so is be holy because I am holy. So another picture, God brings you out of the trash can that you've been digging in and that you reek of and he brings you into his house. He dresses you, he washes you, he adopts you, he gives you his name, you're a part of his family, you have his righteousness, you eat from the king's table. Do not walk out of the house and go jump back into the trash can. Don't eat out of it. Why would you do that? You have been rescued from darkness. You've been rescued from that pain. Why would I go back and want to eat out of that and make myself miserable? That's why the world's so miserable because of their sin. God rescues you from it and you want to go back to it? No, I want nothing to do with that. God, keep me in your house. God, help me to look like your son. Help me to live that out. Amen? Amen. We're going to respond now and I want to give you an opportunity just to confess your sins before the Lord. As believers, this is a good practice. God, I'm sorry. Help me to be holy. And maybe this is the first time for some of you who don't know the Lord to say, this is time. I do recognize I'm a sinner and I trust in your son. So take a moment and confess your sins, known and unknown, before the Lord. Forgiveness is very costly. What it costs the son is incomprehensible. To be that holy and yet to become that sinful. It costs the father to abandon his son and put wrath on him. Forgiveness is costly. So what you hold in your hand is an incredible declaration of something that I want you to hear, but hear it in the context of the whole sermon. Are you ready for this? God loves you. Don't forget it. Don't deny it. And if you do, you come back and you look at the cross and you remember God doesn't have to say it again. He need not. With an action as such as that, you look at the cross and you go, yes, I don't need to hear it again. I don't need a sign because he gave you the greatest sign possible in the cross. And now we partake of the elements in which Jesus set aside for his church to remember his death, to proclaim his glory. He's coming once again. And in the meantime, we remember we're loved and we're forgiven because of what he has done. The Christian life is a life of grace. He has saved us by grace. We partake by grace. And by believing in that grace, we have all that we need. Amen? Amen. Let's pray and then we shall partake. Father, thank you for giving us the costly, perfect, holy son of God. I can say it, but I can't even fully grasp the depth of it. Bless our hearts to grasp it more in our Christian walks with you. Jesus, thank you for giving up yourself. Thank you for being humiliated, abandoned, and you tasted wrath in my place, in our place. Lord, we praise you, we thank you, and it's in your name we pray and partake. Amen. You may partake.